This is Jay Ferber, and you're watching the TV Writer Podcast. So I want to tell you a little bit about our main sponsor for the episode. Script Anatomy is a screenwriting school that gets incredible results. In just four years, their students have won 58 fellowships, half of them at major studios. In 2020 alone, Script Anatomy won four out of 11 fellowships at CBS and three out of eight at Warner Brothers. Why? Because the instructors are all working writers with current credits. They teach a consistent tool-based program and they treat students like emerging professionals. To get your writing career started, go to scriptanatomy.com. My name's Gray Jones and you're watching the TV Writer Podcast, episode 127 for January 11th, 2022. Wow, so exciting to say that. But I'm here with comic and TV writer Jay Ferber. How are you doing, Jay? I'm good. Thanks for having me. I, I'm so excited to talk to you because you are a genuine longtime writer of comics. You've written some big titles, but then you've also written many television series and, and you continue to write for, for both mediums. And so I think this is going to be a particularly interesting episode. Awesome. Now, I, I should mention that usually this podcast focuses on the TV writer and how they navigate their career. Mm -hmm. And we will get to that in a bit. But when I called out for questions, I got an unprecedented <laughs> number. Like I literally have never had anywhere near that number of people weighing in. And mm -hmm. so I, I didn't think it was fair to those people not to address a few of the things that sure. they were bringing up. And, and particularly, they were dealing with um, the, the finale in the last season of Supergirl. Mm -hmm. And we generally don't talk plot on this podcast, but we will do this just as an excerpt. Sure. I'll put it on YouTube just to address those questions, and then the rest will be our normal format. Great. Um, so, so first of all, the the big thing that everybody's talking about is um, was there queer baiting? You hear about this Supercorp thing. I think definitely. I know from the very beginning of Supergirl that that representation was always a big deal on the show, and and mm -hmm. it's been lauded for that representation. But um, I think it's a it's a it's, it's a good question to ask because there is a segment of fans that feel a certain way about how this might happen in the show sure. or that might happen in the show. How much does that get talked about in the writer's room? And, and what can you tell me about the decision-making process, particularly for these big plot points and big season arcs? Sure. I mean, it's, it's a complicated subject. Just... For one thing, the writer's room is uh, sacred, sounds like too strong a word, but but there has to be trust and and uh, a level of comfort in the writer's room for writers to be able to uh, tell stories about themselves, open up emotionally, be vulnerable, to, to dig deep and find, uh, you know, moments from your life that you may want to mine uh, for storytelling. Uh, and so I can't really talk in too much detail about decisions and, and storytelling decisions we made in the writer's room because uh, I don't want to betray any trust but also because like I'm not the showrunner you know the uh I'm uh, I'm a foot soldier on Supergirl I'm I'm one of many writers and and I, I don't make the decisions uh and on a show like Supergirl which is based on a on an IP an intellectual property uh, an existing character who's been around for decades any big storytelling decision in terms of her costume, her love life, her secret identity, her career, all of these things would have to get signed off on. I mean, the show would have to want to do it. DC Comics has to sign off on it. Warner Brothers has to sign off on it. The CW has to sign off on it. So I, I can't even begin to break down why we chose to tell one story and not another and, and whose decision it was. You know, if, if the showrunners or Warner Brothers wants to, to you know, peel back the curtain uh, or pull back the curtain, I guess is the expression, uh, uh, they can, but it, it's not my place to do that. Uh, I will say our writer's room was uh, diverse and inclusive, and uh, we did talk about uh, the romantic pairings of our characters and stuff, but sometimes... In storytelling, you know, the story's not always going to go the way that you want it to or expect it to or think it should. Uh, we just chose to tell the stories that we felt were right for these characters, uh, and that's what ended up on screen. Mm. Yeah, and I, and I think, I mean, people have to remember, Melissa Benno was getting a, a haircut was an <clears throat> issue. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when she went to the bangs <clears throat> or when she wanted 
um, to, to have pants instead of right. a skirt. Right. I mean, these things have to go way up the chain, yes. even for very small decisions like yes, that. Yes, exactly. So there's a lot of people who have to be on board with, with any storytelling decision like that. Uh, and so I, I, I'm just saying, I'm saying that so that it's not uh, all put on the shoulders of the writers. Like this was our decision to do something or not to do it. Uh, of course, the writers have to be, and, and the showrunners especially, have to be on board with a story. Like, if they don't want to do it, it's never going to get up to anybody else who has to sign off on it. Uh, but, you know, the truth is that, that you know, even the showrunner is, is considered, you know, the, the boss of the show, and that's true, but only up to a certain extent. There's always somebody they have to answer to, uh, be it the network, the studio, you know, DC Comics, who owns the IP, uh, so it's it's a lot more complicated, I think, than a lot of people give it credit. Mm -hmm. And I, I think perhaps one of the things that might have fed this a little bit is is recently mm -hmm. um, uh, Superman's son came out as bisexual mm -hmm. in the comics. Um, but ev even in a case like that, that's a very specific comic. Right. It's not necessarily all of the su Superman comics, um, and that's a specific application of that character that won't necessarily translate into Superman and Lois. Right. So can you just just talk a little bit about DC's involvement in uh, in the series? I mean, yeah, DC would, they would be on notes calls, like at the beginning of the season, uh, we would normally get like a a, a, a packet or, a, or a, a binder from DC of potential villains that they were offering up or supporting characters or just anybody from their catalog that they thought like, hey, you know, these are available to you if you want because certain shows get kind of dibs on on certain characters on characters that are that are part of their you know their canon uh and so sometimes we look at those characters and think or oh, there is there anybody we want to use in our season um or sometimes we'll find a character we'll be telling a story and think you know oh we should have a villain who could create ice and then we'll look at the dc comics characters who can create ice and we'll find one that we think we can use and you know uh we'll run that up in dc we'll either say yes or no and if they say no sometimes they'll give us uh variations on on like oh you can't use this character but you can use this one uh <clears throat> alex becoming sentinel is a good example of that because we knew we wanted her to have a costumed identity and uh we, but we didn't know what yet exactly and so i think we talked to dc and they're like well you know there's the same sentinel that we've used in the past for various characters you know, you can have that if you want. And we thought, oh, that's great. And so we worked that into her story and, and tied it into John's time on Mars with, you know, why he designated her that name. Uh, so DC is involved. Uh, you know, they, they, they have to approve things and they're, they're, uh, uh, they're an added benefit. You know, they, they uh, help us in terms of, like I said, offering up characters that we can use if we want. Yeah, and, and I think it's important to remember Supergirl just had its finale, mm -hmm. the character in the comics is going to live on for a right. long time. So yes. DC really has a, a vested interest yeah. in the further storytelling of that character. Totally, totally. And you see, there's, and, and it, these ca characters all have different iterations. Like there's going to be a Supergirl in the new Flash movie, apparently, who's not connected to our Supergirl in any way. And the stuff going on in the Supergirl comic right now is not connected to what we've done on the show or what's happening in the Flash movie. So these characters all have different iterations. Uh, you know, it would be kind of funny sometimes in the writer's room, I'd get asked, like, well, how is it, you know, what, what's the canon? What, what, how is it in the comics? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, which comics? <laughs> like, there's the Peter David run of Supergirl. There's, you know, the, uh, this run of Supergirl. And, and there's, you know, it's, she's been changed and rebooted so many times that it's, canon is kind of a, a moving target. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I do want to be fair to the fans as well. Um, DC listens. Yeah, and and you know, I mean, if people are vocal, um, they they made you may just see one of the characters from the Supergirl series end up in the comics, and it's happened yeah. before. Yeah, yeah, Dreamer is yeah. a good example. Dreamer was originally the, our version of Dreamer. You know, she's sort of tied to the Legion, but uh, Nia Nal was created on Supergirl, and now she's appearing in DC Comics. So yeah, these these tend to bleed into each other. Very very cool. Um, next question, and there are a couple of questions in this sort of neighborhood, where um, Jay wrote this episode mm -hmm. and this happened. Why does he feel this needs to happen mm -hmm. or something like that? And, and I, I think it, it just 
betrays sort of a, a perhaps a lack of understanding about the process of how an episode of television is developed. Yes. And so why don't you tell me about that right from the sort of season arcs and how those are decided right on to an episode being written. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I could talk for half an hour about just this part of the process. Yeah. Uh, and every writer's room is different. On Supergirl, uh, we would start each season with, you know, we would talk for a couple of weeks about that season in particular. What do we want to say? What is, what is the theme of our season? What are we trying to say? Uh, and kind of once we settle on that, we'll start to talk about more story. Like how to, okay, we want to talk about this, this theme or this subject, but what's the actual story that we're going to tell? And, and we'll talk for a couple weeks about that and, and, you know, find the villain that we want to use, uh, you know, as the, uh, you know, to help get this story going. Uh, and then we'll start breaking down. By that point, we usually know how many episodes we're doing that year. And so we'll put those up on a board of just, you know, if we're doing 20 episodes, we have 20 columns. And we'll just start putting in, like, uh, goalposts or mile markers of, okay, you know, let's say this season's about Supergirl losing her powers. So we think she's going to lose her powers in episode four. That sounds like a good place. And we'll put that on episode four. And then in episode 10 a new form of kryptonite arrives on Earth and it gives her new powers. In this case, so that's episode 10. And then episode 14, we realize these new powers are killing her. That's gonna happen around 14. And then in episode 19, they find the cure. And then in episode 20, she can save the day. And so those, we have our big sort of goalposts and there's a lot to fill in in between there. But that's enough to get us started to breaking individual episodes. And then when we break individual episodes, then we dig into that episode in particular and, and put that up on a board. And, and each episode would have a theme. What is the theme of this episode? How do we dramatize that theme? Uh, you know, what characters do we have this episode? Because something else people aren't aware of is that not every actor is guaranteed to be in every episode. Even character, even actors whose names appear as, as series regulars may not be contracted to appear in every single episode. They may be 18 episodes out of 20. And so we have to build in two episodes that they don't appear in. Or if we want to use them in all 20, we have to pay them extra for those extra two episodes that aren't part of the budget. Uh, so those are decisions that, that have to be made as we break the episodes. Uh, and how, uh, how many are, uh, were on the staff in those last couple of uh, seasons? We had, I believe, 12 writers uh, both seasons that I was on the show. And that includes our two showrunners. Uh, and so on Supergirl, every episode was co-written. So you'd have at least two writers, sometimes three, sometimes four on the episode. Uh, and sometimes you would know at the start of, of the break, when you're talking about that episode, you would know who's going to write it. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're three or four days into figuring out what the episode is before it's decided, okay, you two are going to write it. Mm. Um, and, just, and just so people understand, because mm -hmm. I think there'll be a lot of people tuning in who may not... Um, know much about television writing. Mm -hmm. When you say breaking an episode, yes. you're going through beat by beat, scene by scene. Yeah. When I say breaking an episode, that means we're, we're breaking the story. We're figuring out what the story is. We're, we're figuring out the twists and turns, the setups and the payoffs, literally what happens, like you said, in every scene. Uh, and we don't usually, we start kind of a bigger picture of, of what the general shape of the episode is. And you get, you kind of zoom in closer and closer uh, through the process. Like, you'll say, okay, this scene is a fight scene between Supergirl and Lex Luthor. That's enough for now. And then we talk about the next scene and we keep going and then we'll circle back and get more detail. Okay, we know this is a fight between Supergirl and Lex Luthor, but where's the fight happening? Okay, it's gonna be at the waterfront. Okay, well, what's, you know, we'll talk more detail about the fight. What makes this fight different than the other times she's fought Lex? What is, you know, what's he doing? Is it nighttime or daytime? What are the, you know, just what's the choreography? What makes this different? Uh, and we'll do that for all the scenes, just getting in more detail. And that's the whole staff. Everybody's in there, the showrunners, all the writers, except for whatever writers might be off writing the previous script. Uh, but everybody's collaborating on it. Everybody's pitching ideas, even if it's not their episode. Uh, there are plenty of episodes that have moments or like a line of dialogue that I've pitched, but my name isn't on it. And there are plenty of episodes I've written that have these moments that were pitched by other writers, even though their names aren't on it. Um, and it goes to the outline stage as well, and is that sent to the network? It goes, yeah. The So before we even get to an outline, you've, we first write what's called a story document. Some shows call it a story area. Some call it a story arena. 
Um, and this is anywhere from a page to four pages of just sort of uh, a synopsis of what the episode is. Sort of imagine, you know, the, the, the back of a Blu-ray or the back of a paperback novel, that, that sort of summary of the episode. It's, a, it's kind of like that, of here's the story we're telling in broad strokes, uh, here's the emotion, here are the plot moves. That gets sent to the studio and the network. They chime in with any notes they have. Uh, and then it would, on some shows it goes to an outline. By the time I got to Supergirl, we didn't do outlines. Uh, every other show I've been on, you would turn in, you would break down those scenes into an outline of anywhere from 10 to 20 pages. And then that gets sent to the network and the studio. And the outline tells the story scene by scene uh, in kind of an abridged version. Sometimes there's a little bit of sample dialogue, usually there's not. Um, on Supergirl, uh, I think they started out doing outlines, but I didn't join until season five, and by that point, I think the studio and the network, everybody trusted that everybody knew what they were doing, and so they didn't need to see an outline at that stage. Um, sometimes we would write run internally, just for ourselves, to make sure everything kind of felt right. Uh, but then we would go, go off to script, and then the script is divided up. You know, if you have two writers, you're each writing half of it. Uh, sometimes you would divide a script up uh, on Supergirl, we had six acts uh, and, you know, divided up by commercial breaks. Um, and so generally, you know, some, you know, you would each write three acts. Um, sometimes you would divide it up. Okay, you write the first three. I'm going to write the back three and we'll just put it together. Sometimes it's I'll write acts one, three, and five, and you're going to write two, four, and six, and we put it together. Sometimes it makes more sense to write storylines. Like if... Supergirl and Alex are on one storyline and rarely interact with Brainy and Nia and John who are on a different storyline. Sometimes it makes more sense for one writer to write one storyline and the other writer to write another. It makes combining it a little more difficult because then you have to, you're literally cutting and pasting every different scene back and forth. Uh, but that's another way to write it. And you put them all together into a script. You read it, you give each other notes. Sometimes you'll get notes from other writers, uh, and then it goes to the showrunners for their notes. You'll do a couple rounds of notes with the showrunners. Uh, sometimes the showrunners will take a pass and, and do a rewrite of their own. Other times they don't, and they'll just give you notes, and you'll do the own, your own rewrite. Uh, and once the showrunners are happy with it, then the script goes to the studio, and you get a round of notes from the studio, and then it goes to the network, and you get a round of notes from the network. Uh, and then once the network is happy with it, then it goes into wow. production and you have a production draft and that's what goes to everybody in Vancouver and, and they can start actually working on the episode and building sets and, and scouting locations and casting guest roles and, and all that stuff. And then again, all shows are different on Supergirl, at least one writer until COVID hit would go up to set for that episode. And the next writer would go back into the writer's room and, and contribute to helping break the next episode. And the writer who's up on set is generally the one who does production rewrites, because this happens all the time. Uh, there was an episode I wrote uh, with another writer that was written to have a, a date between Kara and William, and that date was going to be mini golf. Problem was, we were shooting it in Vancouver in January, and there's not <laughs> going to be mini golf. Nobody's going to play mini golf in January in Vancouver, where it's raining or snowing or just cold and wet. Uh, and so we rewrote it to be playing pool at a at a bar. Uh, and so I rewrote it uh, just because of the location. That's something that you know you rewrite. We're going to shoot it in two days, and then the you know the bosses sign off on your rewrite, and it and you know it gets woven back into the script. Uh, and little things like that will come up on set, little changes you have to make for production or, hey, you know, this scene is three pages and it's great, but our day is really tight and can you knock off half a page of this scene? And so then you have to go in and rewrite that scene and try to keep all the emotion and all the plot logic and everything, but make it just shorter. Find a way to, to communicate the same idea, but in less time to make it more simple to shoot so that we can make our days, uh, which means not going into overtime. Uh, so it's a long process and there's a lot of people involved and a lot more people than just the two or three or four names that you see on that episode. Right, right, and, and, and people gotta understand, I mean, I've, I've been on the receiving end of notes and major things can change with every notes pass. Yeah. So when the studio, weigh, or showrunner yeah. weighs in, when the studio mm -hmm. weighs in, when the network weighs in, there, there can be significant changes, and that continues even into post-production. Yeah, and, th and there are sometimes things that just get cut for time or get cut for, 
I, I've I've been on episodes, I can't think of any on Supergirl in particular, but where an entire storyline has just been dropped because the episode was too long or it wasn't quite working. And so we'll just drop this, you know, six, you know, drop this B story uh, and the episode works without it. Mm. And then you have all this stuff that we wrote and shot that actually doesn't make it in the episode. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of stuff can change. Uh and sometimes it's based on notes because somebody doesn't like what's been written. Other times it's just based on logistics of mini golf sounds great, but we just physically can't make it happen. So what else can we do that captures that same vibe? Yeah. And uh, you hinted at this a little bit in a number of other questions I, I know have very direct answers. Mm -hmm. And that's um, there were some production challenges. Mm -hmm with COVID yeah. and, and other external forces yes. during the last couple of seasons. Yeah. Um, can you talk uh, specifically about those? Yeah, I mean, in I forget the timeline exactly, but I know we, we knew going into season six that Melissa was pregnant and uh, ne was going to need maternity leaves. And so we had to build that into the story we were telling. So that meant we have to build episodes that don't have a lot of Supergirl in them. Uh, and you know, we came up with a plan to, uh, you know, send her to the Phantom Zone. Uh, and then we block shot some stuff so that s we concocted a schedule so that Supergirl could be in every episode, or I think most of them. Uh, but we would shoot all of her scenes when she was back from maternity leave, uh, all her scenes in the Phantom Zone. Um, and then we thought, okay, we have a plan. Melissa's maternity leave is going to disrupt things and we had a we had planned like a mini hiatus for the writers because everything would just shut down for a while and then COVID happened and that blew all that up so then we had to figure out a schedule that would allow us to shoot safely during a pandemic and would also accommodate Melissa's maternity leave all this was happening at the same time uh and you know so we shut down for a while and you know people who were not me people higher up uh on the food chain were the ones who were making these big decisions of you know, how are we going to do this? How are we? It, it literally changed how many days we would take to shoot an episode because it, we couldn't move as fast because people had to be masked and there had to be safety protocols and social distancing. Uh, and so it, it made our episodes, uh, we just had to write them differently. The fight scenes couldn't be quite as, as complicated as they once were. Crowd scenes were harder to do. Um, intimate scenes between characters who were in a relationship we had to be careful about that even i think that there was a scene where brainy and nia were going to kiss but ultimately it turned into either a hug or like a hand on a shoulder just because the scene didn't need a kiss and so why risk it because this was kind of before vaccine status and all that stuff um so there's there were a lot of challenges but our crew and and our bosses figured it out and um it was safe you know we we pulled it off we we did a season of television during a pandemic uh but it definitely impacted it also impacted guest cast because to fly to canada you have to quarantine for two weeks upon arrival before you could even shoot anything uh and so if you were casting somebody you're like well can we bring up an actor from hollywood or do we need to cast local out of vancouver and who can we get and what makes the most sense and then you know if you're casting an actor who's going to be in three episodes in a row that might make more sense because they can quarantine be there for three whole episodes and then go home but if you're having an actor who's going to be in one episode and then not one and then be in the third like do they go back and forth and have to quarantine all those times or do they just stay in vancouver the whole time if they're not working all of these things had to be figured out uh it also meant the writers couldn't go to set uh just because it why take that risk like it's it's very helpful uh to have them there but it wasn't absolutely necessary so instead the writers would stay here in california and cover set virtually meaning we would have a, a live feed on our computer or our ipad uh of what they were shooting and we'd be on a constant text or phone call with the director to like yeah that looks good or oh you know i think maybe we should try it this way or or whatever if they had questions uh but it, it worked we made it work it was everybody adapted pretty well uh, but it definitely had an impact on actors that we could cast and just the kinds of stories and the kind of scenes that we could safely produce. Mm. Wow. Well, I, I got to say, I have a lot more respect for <laughs> um, all of the shows that we're able to release, like Superman and Lois, yeah. Supergirl, 
a number of shows were able to somehow make it through yep. this crazy challenge of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and, and, and to be fair, I, I noticed as a viewer, a lot of romantic storylines being affected. Mm -hmm. um, like in other shows, it's, it's funny, the kiss happens in a, in a big wide right. shot instead yeah. of in a close shot. So yep. you don't realize they're not actually kissing right. and things like that. Yep. But hey, we got we got to watch TV through yeah. this crazy time. Exactly, exactly. It's it's it's. Uh, I think it's a testament to how talented these crews are, in particular, who pulled off all of this stuff. Shooting what I think it turned out pretty well in terms of fight scenes and 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 everything. That that uh, given all the constraints, uh, I'm not saying we should be graded on a curve. But, you know, there were a lot of things that happened this season for everyone who was making television. Very cool. So uh, we're going to continue with just a couple more questions, uh, fun ones. Johnny Cisco, um, you've interacted with him before. He asked about, uh, are there any plans that you have to develop anything for Greatest American Hero? I'm a huge Greatest American Hero fan. It's one of my favorite shows when I was a kid, and I, I still love it to this day. Uh, I was so fortunate my... What was it? My second to last Supergirl episode was directed by Tanya McKiernan, who is the daughter of Stephen J. Cannell, who wow. created The Greatest American Hero and is one of my idols. And Tanya is a force to be reckoned with in her own right. Uh, she's an incredible director and one of the favorites on Supergirl. Uh, I have no plans to do anything with The Greatest American Hero as much as I would love to. I would love to to, to get my hands on that that character and that property and, and to work you know, with Tanya would be amazing. Uh, but there's I there's nothing going on, uh, yeah. at least that I'm involved with. Yeah, very cool. Um, and also Craig Byrne, who we all know, uh, author of several of Smallville companion books and also the Krypton site family of websites. He created amazing websites. He asks about your comics, Noble Causes and Near Death, and if you have any plans to adapt those to the screen. Yeah, um, both have come close in the past. They're both two of my favorite comics that I've ever worked on. Uh, uh, Nothing in the works right now, I guess, is what I could say. Mm -hmm. uh, we have come close. We will continue to uh, try to push that rock up the hill. Um, and hopefully someday there'll be something on, on our screens we can watch. Very cool. Right, we're going to take a quick sponsor break, and we'll be back to talk all about Jay. AVGearGuy.com uses state-of-the-art technology to bring new life to old films and videos, like the Lost Betty White series Pet Set, which they recently restored for its 50th anniversary. They can apply the same technology to your documentary, film and video archive, and family videos. Visit avgearguide.com for details. Drivingfootage.com provides 360-degree driving plates for film and TV. Over 14,000 clips are available for locations all around Southern California, with more areas coming soon. A fully equipped camera car with height-adjustable rig is available for custom shoots. Visit drivingfootage.com for details. Full disclosure, I do own both of these companies. By supporting them, you help me bring new in-person video interviews to you. And we're back. And of course, um, you're, you're just a little younger than me. Um, we grew up in the 70s, a time which was so exciting for comics. <laughs> I, I remember um, as soon as I got my allowance, I rushed to the store to buy whatever I could afford. Uh, Richie Rich was 35 cents. and the good comics, Marvel and DC, were 75 cents, which was all of my week's allowance, but yeah. I put it all into that book and <laughs> raced home to read it. I think that's a bit of your story, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't recall my first comic, but I know that I came to comics through two paths. One was the uh, Adam West Batman, which was in reruns when I was a kid. I'd watch it afternoons after school, and Saturday morning Super Friends cartoons. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then... Um, I remember, you know, I, I would buy comics occasionally, uh, but I remember this had to be, this was early to mid, I think early 80s, New Teen Titans. Uh, I was just at the local pharmacy and came across this issue of the New Teen Titans, which I had never seen the comic before, and it was just uh, changed my life. I was just like, oh my God. Like, So wait, Robin, Batman's sidekick, has his own team, of like cool superheroes and he's got this alien girlfriend like what is this it was the coolest thing i'd ever seen uh and then that got me on board then i was a, a big time fan of of new teen titans but everything i said that really got me collecting comics and uh i just have never stopped to this day very cool very cool so you you wrote and drew 
uh, your own comics yes. growing up, but there was a point that you decided that you wanted to just be writing them. When yeah. was that? That was, yeah, I, I wrote and drew my own comics all through, you know, elementary school and even into high school. And then, uh, you know, was really into art, really loved drawing superheroes and everything, and even was an art major for one semester at a local community college. Uh, but I just, it wasn't for me. Like, my, my classmates would spend hours on a painting of a bowl of fruit. And I just didn't have the patience. Like, I, I wanted, I would quickly scribble it out and I would want to move on to the next thing. And I realized that it just didn't have the discipline uh, or, or the interest, I guess. Uh, because one of my professors pulled me aside one day and said, you know, if you want to dr learn to draw comics, you're going to have to learn how to draw. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I don't think I do. And I realized that what really appealed to me about comics was the storytelling. It was really the writing. I was only drawing them because I had no one else to draw them. And I didn't understand at that point that you could just write a script. Uh, and I, around that time, I was also really getting into mystery novels. Uh, and so I decided to just pivot into writing. Uh, and at that point, I, I didn't even really care what. I wanted to write novels. I wanted to write comics. TV was not even, like, a possibility. Um, I didn't... I grew up in, in like rural Pennsylvania. I didn't know anyone who'd ever gone to film school or worked in television, so it was, wasn't was even on my horizon. Uh, but but I, I knew that you could write novels and I knew that people wrote comics, and so that's what I wanted to do. And it wasn't until much later in life that writing for television actually became more of a like actual possibility that I could pursue. Mm. And, and it's interesting, your, your first published story was, was What If, What If, Marvel's What If. Yeah. Um, now it's actually on yeah. the screen and going to I season two. I was ahead two. of the curve. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Uh, any interest in writing for that series? Uh, yeah, that'd be a ton of fun. Uh, just the stuff they've done is, is really interesting and, and just the, I think the animation style is incredible. Mm. Uh, yeah, that would be a lot of fun. I mean, the reason that I was given that my first gig was this issue of What If is because the book had already been canceled. And the editor wanted to try me out and was like, well, I can give you this. Like, literally nothing. What's the worst could happen? The book's already going away. So I wrote the very last issue of this book and proved my chops enough that he gave me another job and another one. And then, you know, I was getting regular work before too long. Very cool. Well, um, tell me about sort of, uh, it, was, it was about maybe a decade of writing comics, a little more before you started moving into TV. Yeah, a little more. I, I think I broke in in 98 into comics and then broke into TV, I think in 2011, 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, a little over a decade. Um, and it was, I had, I had gone from writing comics at Marvel and DC to writing my own stuff at Image. Uh, and then uh, my good friend Brian Vaughn uh, moved to LA and got hired on the staff of Lost. And I started hearing his stories about being in the writer's room. And he was my first example of like, oh, you could actually pivot from comics to TV. Uh, and I was living in Seattle at the time and would fly down to LA to visit Brian and hang out. And, and I got a Hollywood manager. Uh, and at one point, uh, there was a, a screenwriter attached to develop one of my comics, a book called Dynamo 5. And I had met with her and heard her ideas. And, you know, they weren't bad. And uh, went back and had lunch with Brian and his wife. And they said, you know, if Dynamo 5 gets turned into a movie, she's going to make more money on it than you will as the person who created it. Oh, like, wow. Why aren't you writing this script? And I was like, yeah, why aren't I? And I called my manager and I said, yeah, I want to write this. If anybody's going to write this, it should be me. And you know, she said, okay. And so I wrote a draft of a movie just on spec. And it's, it's terrible, but I at least wrote it. Um, and then around that time, I started getting more serious about TV and movies. And there are these programs in Hollywood that the studios uh, have created. The Warner Brothers TV Workshop the NBC writers on the verge, CBS has one, I think Fox has one. Um, and they're sort of like a, a, a writer's boot camp. Mm -hmm. um, and so I applied to all of these. I wrote a spec script and sent it to all of them and actually got an interview on the Warner Brothers one. Uh, so I flew down to LA and stayed on Brian's couch and, and interviewed, flew back home to Seattle and, and told them that, look, if I get in, I'll move down here. Cause it wasn't paid. It, it's mm -hmm. unpaid. Everybody else applying already lived here, I believe. Uh, but I got in. And so oh, I packed yeah. up my life nice. and moved down to LA uh, and got an apartment. And this, this workshop was like one night a week for, I think like five months, maybe. We started in October, November and ended in like March, April. Uh, and then it, it, it's a boot camp. It, it's you hear from showrunners and other writers and directors and, and 
uh, agents and managers, and it's just kind of an intensive as to how a, how a TV staff works. Uh, and then after that, the uh, the instructors set you up for meetings with Warner Brothers executives and Warner Brothers showrunners. And so I met on a bunch of Warner Brothers shows from that season and got hired onto a show called Ringer, hmm. uh, starring Sarah Michelle Gellar on the CW. Uh, and that was my first TV gig. Uh, and now I'm here. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Honestly, those fellowships are amazing. Yeah. Um, and they pay uh, part of your salary the first year too. They're all a little different. Um, I know they may have changed, but I know for a long time, the ABC Disney fellowship, you would actually get a salary. You were mm -hmm. a salaried employee, uh, for a year. Um, with Warner brothers, they would, so if a war, if a showrunner hired a, somebody from the Warner Brothers program, you were free to that showrunner for the first, I think, 20 weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, because the, 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 the Warner Brothers program would pay your salary. And then after those 20 weeks, if the showrunner liked you and wanted to keep you, they had to find the money in their budget to keep you. Uh, and I was fortunate that, that my bosses on Ringer uh, did that. They, they found the money and kept me on, so I did the full season. Um, very, very cool. But yeah, they're, they're a huge uh, entry point uh, to this uh, to this industry and and most of the people in my class uh there were i think eight or nine of us mm -hmm. and a lot of us are still in the business wow. um some of them are showrunners now uh, others have gone on to other paths but uh but they have a i think coming out of that program i said like i said there were eight or nine of us and all but one of us got staffed on a show so like wow. the success rate coming out of it is is pretty tremendous very cool very cool so to, to talk about that first experience in on ringer in the in the writers room what was that like and what was that room like yeah it was great it was a great room um it was uh eric carmelo and nicole snyder created the show uh and a woman named pam vise was brought in to help run it because eric and nicole had never run a show they were relatively lower level writers i think they were story editors at mm. that point maybe a little higher um but it was great they had a really clear vision for what the show was and were really clear about what they wanted it to be and the staff was great. Um, I was a staff writer. Uh, I think I was the only staff writer. So everybody else, I was I was the lowest on in the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a writer's assistant named Bob Barons who I became really good friends with, and he's running Kung Fu now. Wow. Uh, and and he was he wrote episodes of Ringer even as mm -hmm. even as an assistant. Um, I'm friends with everybody on that staff to this day. Uh, mm. It was a great experience. We shot here in LA, so I got to go to set for my episodes. Uh, Which is not common for a staff writer. It, it's not common for a staff writer. I mean, it, it kind of depends on the show about who goes to set, uh, but being in LA makes it much easier for everybody to go, uh, or even to go if it's not your episode. Like there was one yeah. day where uh, we were shooting on the beach one night, on a Friday night, and it wasn't my episode, but I was like, I'll go hang out on the beach for a while and just hang out, and uh, which is harder to do if you're shooting out of town. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was really great, a great experience. I got to be, they, the, the bosses were empowering in the sense that even as a staff writer, I was attending uh, production meetings, which doesn't always happen, and I could actually speak in them, which also doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. There are some shows where the staff writer is basically, you don't speak unless spoken to. Wow. Uh, but on day one, I asked the bosses like, what are you, what am I here for? What are you expecting of me? Do you want me to pitch? And they're like, yeah, you're here to work. Mm -hmm. We want your ideas, we want you to speak up. and. So yeah, I, they were they honored that. It was mm -hmm. a great experience. Very cool, very cool. Um, and so you you did a couple episodes of Avengers Assemble. Was mm -hmm. that a full staff experience or were those freelance? Yeah, I did two episodes of Avengers Assemble, and those were just freelance gigs mm -hmm. uh, that I uh, some guys I knew from the comic book world, uh, Joe Kelly, Steve Siegel, Duncan Rillo, and Joe Casey are uh, have a kind of a collective called Man of Action, and they uh, produce and create a bunch of animated shows, and they were running this Avengers cartoon, and Joe Casey had, I had run into him in a comic shop or something, and he was like, hey, if you're, you know, if you're not staffed or, or you know, or looking for work, let me know, we always have stuff, and, you know, you could work with us. And so, you know, I wrote two episodes of Avengers with them. And it was, cool. it was very different from doing live action, mm. mainly because, uh, the story was already the story was basically handed to me. Uh, oh wow! Man of Action broke it and just handed me an outline, and we're like, "Here's the episode. Just turn it into a script." And so I just took their outline and just expanded it, added dialogue and and some more choreography uh, to turn it into a script. But you know, it was it was technically I co-wrote it. We're, we're both billed as writers because they had conceived it, 
broke out the beats and then I just fleshed it out. So it was it was a pretty easy gig. Um, That's pretty neat, actually. I, yeah, I've it was fun. never heard it was of freelance of being done that way. Yeah, I, I don't know how common that is. I'm, I'm pretty ignorant of, of the way animated shows work. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if that was the norm or if that was unusual. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And then from Avengers Assemble, you were a staff writer on Starcrossed. That yes. was another uh, WB show, right? That was uh, CW. Oh, yeah. CW. Yeah. It, it, was, it was produced by CBS. It, CW is weird because CW is owned by Warner Brothers and CBS. Uh, and so all of their shows are technically produced by both studios. Mm -hmm. But one studio is usually kind of the, the hands-on producer. So it was kind of ironic that I went through the Warner Brothers program and got staffed on Ringer, mm -hmm. which was really produced by CBS television. Yeah. And then Starcross was also produced by CBS television, even though it aired on CW. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, Starcross was another uh, CW uh, show about aliens in high school, uh, and that was a fantastic experience. We only did 13 episodes, but it was a ton of fun. Uh, and again, another staff that was super supportive. I'm friends with all of them to this day. We shot in New Orleans, um, so that was fun. I got to go to set, um, wrote my wedding vows in between takes oh, uh, wow. in a swamp in New Orleans, because I got married right after my episode shot. Um, and yeah, it was it was a fun time. Starcross was a lot of fun. Very, very cool. And, and again, good. another another show where you get to go to set as a staff writer. Yeah. Um, from what I hear, that is not generally the norm. Hmm. Yeah, I think it, it just depends on the show, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I have enough enough data to, to know whether it's normal or not. It's been normal for me, thankfully. Yeah. Uh, but it, yeah, you're right. It's not always the case. Yeah, very cool. And, and I'm curious about the fact that you, uh, at that point, or around that point, you released Copperhead, a, a comic mm. title. Yes. Um, how were you involved in comics through that time or was how did I was, come? yeah for especially through like near de through ringer and and uh star crossed i was writing comics and when i went on zoo i was still writing comics and yeah it, it was a juggling act it was mm. this was before i had a son so i uh -huh. had my weekends were free you know early mornings um and so yeah i would normally at that stage of my life i would bang out a comic script over the weekend mm. uh in between tv responsibilities but it was it was tough you know i would be in the writer's room all day and i'd get an email from somebody to image being like hey can you proof these pages you know and i'd be like yeah tonight like mm -hmm. i can't do it now yeah. and so i had to work with image to give me like a buffer like look if you need me to look at something you got to build in like 24 hours like mm. i can't look at it at the drop of a hat anymore because i'm in a writer's room and I can't just pull out my phone or open up my computer and do something else like that's my my day job basically well a lot of a lot of staff writer contracts preclude any outside work too it it's that's usually in television like they so yeah so every, on every show even if you're not a staff writer just if you're if you're contracted to that show like that show owns you and you mm -hmm. can't work on another show while you're on that one you can't write so it's just working free, on another it's, television it's usually show. television yeah. shows like some like Movies, I think sometimes people can write a feature script while they're on a show. I know that happens. I don't know if they had to get special permission or, mm. or but with comics, uh, I know that my reps carved that out. Mm. That, 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 you know, my TV work would not impact my comic book work. But I know that my TV work has to come first. They're the ones, it's no secret that TV pays more than comics for most yeah. people. If you're Brian Vaughn or Robert Kirkman, comics pays you just fine. <laughs> but, but for a lot of us, TV's where the money is. Yeah. And so you mentioned Zoo. Um, you were on that for three seasons, and yeah. on Zoo, you you went up a few levels too, didn't you? Yeah, I was. I started, I guess, as a story editor, and then I was an exec story editor, and then a co-producer by the time I left. Uh, yeah, Zoo was. I, I think I was actually on Supergirl longer in terms of like calendar days, mm -hmm. just because we did more episodes and there was the pandemic and we had a long break. Uh, Zoo, I was on for three seasons, but they were each thirteen episode seasons. Mm. Uh, but that show was uh, a dream. It was so much fun. Uh, it just got crazier and crazier. Uh, the staff was great. Um, and it was the first show that I was on. You know, s sadly, Ringer and Starcross both got canceled after the first season. And mm. Zoo, we got to do three years. We still never got to wrap anything up. It ended on a massive cliffhanger. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. Um, we shot the first season of that in New Orleans. And in the second two, uh, we moved up to Vancouver. Uh, and it was uh, just a lot of fun. And again, another show where I have friends to this day that I made on there. Yeah, and it, it, it really is a different experience when you have a, a long running series. Yeah. Um, you, can, you can fall into a rhythm, you get to know the characters more. Yeah. 
yeah, get to know the characters. And it was also interesting because there was staff turnover. There, we had a different writer's room every year. Uh, and I was one of the only constants. It was the showrunners, me, and then there was a guy named Brian O, who was another writer-producer uh, that stayed on through all, all three seasons. Um, and it's also interesting to see um, when we moved, like, there were people who worked on Supergirl, on the Supergirl crew, that had also worked on Zoo. Just a handful, not many. But there, there was, it's a small world. Mm. You, know, you shoot two shows in Vancouver and you're going to start seeing some crossover. Uh, there were a couple episodes of Supergirl that we had in Iguana who we would then turn into this giant dragon. And the, I was on set when we had the Iguana. And the animal wrangler was somebody that I knew from working on Zoo many, many times. Because yeah. on Zoo we always had animals. Uh, Supergirl, it was a rarity, but it's just a small world that it's, oh, it's a dude from Zoo. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's so much fun watching, uh, especially Stargate SG-1, 10 seasons in Vancouver. They would actually have the same actors playing different parts yeah. <laughs> in different oh, episodes. Yeah. Um, I, I knew a couple of the actors, and it was so fun to see them just yeah. playing completely happens, different parts. Even happens on the CW shows, yeah. on, the, on, the, on the Arrowverse shows. There's actors who've been on Flash who play somebody else on Supergirl, who play somebody else on Legends. It's just, you know, there's only so many actors to go around. Yeah, very, very fun. And so then let's talk about Supergirl. And, yeah. and just from the outside looking in, it would seem that your involvement in comics would make writing a show about a DC character have a little extra impact for you? It was, yeah, it was, it was, this was like a dream gig in a lot of ways uh, because I got to, to mine so much of my superhero, you know, background. Um, and, and just to, yeah, to, to get to work on, a, on an actual, we used to say that Zoo was a comic book and it, and it was in a lot of ways. It was just over the top and, and, you know, everything was heightened. But, you know, Supergirl was a literal comic book. It was characters that I knew from the comics and situations. Yeah, Supergirl was a lot of fun because of all the characters I got to play with. Just just the different corners of the DCU that we would pull from. Uh, like, I was a big Legion fan as a kid. And to see Jesse Rath as Brainiac 5, and especially towards the end, where we got him to be green and in the purple suit and with the blonde hair, like... I, I'm not sure why he was blue with white hair to begin with. I w that was before my time, but seeing him truly as Brainy on screen was amazing. And yeah. uh, and Jesse Rath was a, a, a big nerd and, and really took that role super seriously. <laughs> he had his own Legion ring. Uh, he really kind of delved into it uh, in a great way. And so it was just fun to just to, yeah. to, to be in my element there. And, and, you know, some of the other writers were big comic nerds others were not and it made a good mix because you would have people who had a deep appreciation for the source material and and uh and other people who could come to it with a fresh eye and and look at it in a whole new way uh which was also helpful you know because the show is going to be aimed at more than just people who are diehard comic fans like it has to it has to appeal to a wider audience so it was smart to have that mix on the staff of big nerds like me and then people who who come at it from a different perspective Hmm. I, I've heard that it's actually an asset to have a comic background, uh, or at least to be an enthusiast of the comics. Um, Keto Shimizu is one person mm -hmm. uh, who told me that um, they they like to have at least one person on staff who really knows comics yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, I think that was that was the uh, that was the feeling at Supergirl as well. Like w when they hired me, they hired me and another guy named Jay. And I think part of what made us appealing was that we were both big comic book nerds. Uh, because they had a writer who, who kind of filled that slot who was no longer on the show. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that was a large part of, of what made us attractive to, to the bosses. Mm -hmm. And who were the showrunners on that? This was Robert Rovner and Jessica Queller. Mm, okay. Um, and, uh, and so talk about writing a concluding season. Um, you, you mentioned that Zoo sort of ended on a cliffhanger, mm -hmm. but actually writing to a conclusion is a yeah. rarity in, in TV. Yeah, it was, we, it was a luxury to, to be able to, that, that, that CW gave us that heads up to be like, hey, this is going to be your last season. And they did it early in the season and, and gave us time. They, they even, uh, they were very generous in that. They gave us enough time to actually plan out an ending and to work towards it. Uh, and it was, it was a challenge because, uh, you know, superhero shows or superhero stories, superhero comics, most of them aren't designed to have an ending. They're, mm. they're serialized. They go on forever. It's, it's Superman fights a never-ending battle. Like, they're, they're not supposed to have a, an end point. Um, and so to, to do that uh, on, on our show, to, 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 to try to 
reach an endpoint when one was never designed in the first place hmm. was a challenge, and and to find a way to to and because we didn't want to give the, the 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 sense to the fans that that Kara's story had ended. There there wasn't an ending in the way that there was an ending on you know Breaking Bad, where mm-hmm. uh, where yes, there was a finite ending to that. Uh, here, you know, the characters are going to continue. So it was a nice way to kind of find a, a place in their lives for us to say farewell to them, but mm. to know that their stories are going to continue. Uh, and I think we walked that line pretty well. Uh, we had a fun viewing party for the finale the other night where all the writers got together at a bar and, and were able to watch this together. And it was a really nice, it was nice for two reasons. It was nice just to be able to celebrate the end of the show, mm. but also nice because we hadn't been in the same room together in over a year. Wow. We did this whole season of television during COVID on Zoom. Uh, and so a few of us have seen each other socially, you know, in, in one-on-one or two-on-two or whatever, but, uh, but to have us all together in a room, it had been a long, long time. And so that was really nice to be able to come together and, and, uh, and see that send off, and and uh, I, I think I think it was uh, a good ending, and it was um, the way we left the characters. I thought was pretty satisfying. Mm. Yeah, well, and, and I'm just so impressed. Um, I mean, everybody who follows me on Twitter knows my our family's been big super fans yeah. for a long time. <laughs> um, being able to visit the set in the first yeah. season while it was still a CBS show, um, I'm just so happy that it's been able to be such a success. Yeah. Um, I mean, think of the way the Supergirl movie bombed. Yes, yes. Um, it's not easy yeah. to... It's, it is not yeah. easy, but this show had some kind of alchemy that um, uh, this cast was incredible. Like, they, any one of them could lead their own show. Like, and, and we had them as an ensemble working together. Uh, they were. They all knew their characters inside and out. Were super generous to other actors who would be, you know, guest starring, uh, and and just elevated the material. Uh, anything we gave them that we thought would be funny, they would make hilarious. Hmm. Or if we thought like, oh, this this will be pretty emotional, they would make super emotional because they they just brought it and elevated anything we gave them. Very very cool. Well, we'll start to um, wrap things up here, but. Uh, What's next for you? I mean, Supergirl's wrapped. Um, what, what's in the cards? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it, it's, you know, we are recording this on what, November 13th? 13th. Uh, and we're approaching Thanksgiving, and Thanksgiving is when Hollywood starts to just close up shop until the new year. Mm-hmm. Uh, so not a lot's going to happen right now. I'm working on a new pilot script. I'm working on, I have some new comic book stuff I have. Uh, I have a new book that's going to come out uh, in 2022 that hasn't been announced yet. Uh, I'm close to closing a deal for another new comic series. It'll probably come out either late 22 or early 23. Um, I've started, uh, I mentioned earlier in this interview that uh, at one time I wanted to write prose and I've finally started to do that. 30 some years later, I'm Mm -hmm. I'm working on my first novel, which is super exciting. Very cool. Uh, And yeah, I'll probably end up on another show next year somewhere, whether it's a show that I've created or I'm staffed on somebody else's show. But right now I don't know what that'll be. I'm excited to find out. <laughs> Very cool. So um, as, as we wrap, wrap up, usually we have um, tips for people who are starting out, but I think because you've got these two very distinct um, parts of your background, what tips would you give somebody who wants to start out writing for comics, and what tips would you give for somebody who wants to start out writing for television in okay. today's landscape? Sure, yeah. For comics, I think it's never been more ex- like accessible to, to make a comic because you don't need a publisher at this point. With the internet, you can find an artist uh, and make your own comic and make it available to everybody. You never have to, you know, pay for money to print it out of your own pocket. You don't have to find a publisher. Uh, You can just make your own comics online digitally. Uh, And even if they don't get a huge readership, that's the kind of thing that you can use as a sample to show an editor, to show, like, look, this is something I made. An editor is going to respond more to a finished comic than they are to a comic book script that you wrote. Right. Mainly because the comic's just easier and faster to read. Um, finding an artist is a challenge, uh, but again, the internet has kind of broken down those those barriers. And, and you know, if you're active on Twitter or Instagram, uh, you can, you know, just start networking with other comic fans. Because the beautiful thing about comics is most people who read comics also want to make comics. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you can find a fledgling artist uh, 
you know, if you're still a student, you know, look at the art department, look at the art classes that, that, at, that are at your school. You might find an artist there who, who wants to make comics, somebody to collaborate with. Uh, but yeah, the internet is your friend in that regard. Yeah, and television? Uh, for television, I would, I would watch a ton of TV, um, and not just watch it, but like analyze it. When I was writing my samples to get into these workshops, uh, I wrote a burn notice sample script, a uh, spec script they're called. And so I watched a bunch of burn notices and I would outline them. I would sit there with a legal pad and write, like I would summarize just like a sentence about each scene. Uh, and then I would also analyze how long the acts were, uh, you know, between each commercial break. Okay, the first act tends to be between, you know, nine and 11 minutes. And the second act is between 10 and 12. And then, oh, this fourth act is usually only seven or eight minutes and, and to try to just get a sense of the pacing of mm. that kind of thing. Uh, and if you do that, you'll, you'll really get to see under the hood of how a television show is made. Uh, it sounds mechanical, but it'll really help you see the story in a different way if you outline it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and then just write, just like the more, you, you can find scripts online pretty easily um, to find samples. Uh, there's free uh, screenwriting software that you can find online as well, uh, or at least very low cost. You can buy a trial version or a student version. Um, and then just write as much as you can uh, and write to, to make yourself happy. Don't try to gauge what you think people are gonna be interested in. Uh, I forget who said it, but one of my favorite expressions is, if you can see a bandwagon, it's too late to climb on. Like, uh -huh. so if you think that, uh, like a couple years ago, um, time travel was big on TV. You had Timeless and there was another show, a pilot that had been made, and time travel seemed to be in the zeitgeist. Don't try to do a time travel show. Like the minute you can see a trend, mm -hmm. it's over. Uh, right. Just write what's gonna make you excited. Write the kind of show that you wanna see. Uh, and that enthusiasm will tend to be contagious. Because uh, if you're not excited about it, if you're writing something just because you think that's what people wanna read, it's gonna appear kind of lifeless. You gotta write what excites you, what you can't put down. Even if you don't think there's a market for it, there might be. Uh, and at worst, you know, you're not gonna sell your first script. So just write, just keep writing. Write one script, write another one, then write a third one. You just gotta, the more pages you write, the better you're gonna get. Even at my stage, I want every script I write to be better than the last one I wrote. Uh, I, I try to compare myself to myself, not to other writers. Uh, that advice is hard to maintain all the time. You can't help but compare yourself, but do your best to just compete with yourself. And the more you write, the better you're gonna get. Very cool. That's a great place to end up. I appreciate you being so generous with your yeah. time. Um, at Jay Ferber on Twitter, and yep. I'll put the uh, uh, the correct way to spell your name in, in the show notes. <laughs> yes. uh, any other places to contact you, Instagram uh, or anything like that? I'm on Instagram, but not super active, but mm -hmm. Twitter's the best bet. Twitter's where yep. you can find me. Very cool. Well, thanks so much, Jay, and best of luck to you Thank for you. all your projects in the coming year. Thank you. Please follow me on Twitter for the latest updates. At Gray Jones is my handle. Make sure to bookmark tvwriterpodcast.com and scriptmag.com. You can find the video version of this podcast at iTunes, Podbean, and on YouTube. Make sure you do subscribe to all these places. Audio only, you can find us at iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, or Pandora. And on Instagram, you can follow at tvwriterpodcast.